I mean, yesterday I had to give a talk opposite Pablo's data flow talk, and I really wanted to give my talk and be at the P Pablo's data flow talk. It's not fair, man. It's not fair. Anyways, hi, uh, I'm Robert Burke, and uh, this is, oops, I wrote a portable runner in Go. Uh, if you haven't seen any of my other talks before, I'm a Beam Go busybody at Google. Uh, and this is the story of how I'd kind of like to replace the Go direct runner and why it kind of should be a portable runner instead. Though, really, the correct answer, or the correct name of this talk is actually, oops, I didn't finish writing a uh, portable runner in Go, because uh, if you didn't go see uh, the State of the Go talk yesterday, uh, the short answer is, we've been very busy these last this last year, so uh, time kind of got away from me. See, time management. <laughs> um, so the project got a little bit sidetracked. But that doesn't mean I don't have anything interesting to share with you today. Um, I'll start with the, my motivations for writing this runner in the first place, and describing kind of the light bit of design, a little bit of how beam portability works, and, and, yeah, and a little bit about how beam portability works on the runner side. So at the core of this talk isn't really a question about runners. It's about SDKs. How do we implement a new SDK side features. The tricky bit is really how we uh, end up integration testing these features against these runners. But Robert, you might exclaim, we have runners. Just run them against those. And if it works, it works, right? Well, no. <laughs> different runners have different abilities. We have this big, huge uh, compatibility matrix graph on the website uh, that kind of points out uh, the varying levels of detail, to varying levels of details, uh, what each of the different runners support. So um, let's kind of take a brief step back. Let's make this a little bit more concrete by focusing on, on a specific feature that we'd like to add to an SDK. Some features, by their nature, are very straightforward to test and implement. They either work or they don't. Um, for example, I'm going to pick uh, map side inputs. These were recently added to the Go SDK and illustrate this very well. That you basically turn your KVP collections into lookup tables. If a user is able to um, pass in a key and retrieve the expected values, we know it's working. It's doing its job. We can contrive various pipelines and data sets that require these lookups in order to do there uh, in order to work, in order to verify this behavior. Bing, bang, boom, feature implemented. Um, but there are other Beam features, however, that don't have kind of obvious user side effects. Take uh, the cross bundle state and side input cache. The feature itself is to reduce lookup latency of your side inputs and or state values. Um, and if, especially if they're going to be unchanged between different bundles executing on the worker. Think of it as a kind of a static, think of a like a static side input that is being used in a window to do fun. The windows will change for the data, but the side input is not going to change. Um, by default, the SDKs will kind of just request this data from the runner every single time. Um, and if you've got a lot of different bundles and a lot of different threads going on, this can get a little expensive as data is constantly moving back and forth over the state, uh, the state API. So it makes sense that we'd want to be able to cache this data on the SDK side. Uh, this will uh, help reduce lookups overall. But we, it's not, you can't just blindly cache all data on the SDK side. Memory reasons aside, you might have correctness issues. What if it's not a global side input? What if it's a separate windowed side input that we're projecting into to get the actual correct data? So this feature by itself then requires collaboration between the SDK and the runner in order to successfully operate. So how do we end up testing this? Just because the pipeline succeeds doesn't mean the feature worked. Because as Duke said, it will just happily look things up in the S or from the runner every time. That's part of what the beam, it should just, that's part of beam, it should just work. So it should just work with or without the caching. So first, 
you can have, you should absolutely make sure that it, the feature is enabled SDK side for your pipeline. This is how you would do that for Go right now uh, until we uh, enable it kind of just by default. Um, you could add different metrics to collect timestamps and see if the pipeline is faster, whether the feature enabled or not. If the change is very small, you can multiply how often you're doing these lookups in order to uh, measure the larger change and just make that easier. But even with all that, you could still run it and not actually get any performance changes. Why? Because different runners have different abilities. The runner itself might not actually be implementing the side input cache. So even if the SDK is doing everything correctly, it might not actually be operating for your, or for your uh, pipeline. So, okay, great. You pick a runner that has it implemented. You've got, you made sure that the SDK supports the feature that you've got it implemented or enabled, and you determine ways of measuring it. But even then, on a production runner, when you submit your pipeline and when it's executing it, it might determine that it is not actually the best case to use this feature for your pipeline. So it ends up with no change at all. So then you have to look into how it kind of operates on the runner side and how it and the, the runners make these decisions. <sighs> so you add internal metrics and hack in a way to get at them from an arbitrary worker and validate in that case if and when the feature is used, you have a way of detecting it and it's actually making a positive difference to the performance of the test case that you're trying to figure out and make sure that the feature is actually working to the best of its ability. So I don't know about you, but this whole process is just exhausting. And this is only just a description of it. Imagine needing to deal with that for every single feature we're adding to SDKs. Um, so it gets to a lot of work to just build, validate built-in Beam features for every new SDK, even if you know it was coming. So we're being fought most of the way by our own tools. So like I said, Beam has features that are intended to be kind of optional for runners. That's why we have the, uh, the capability matrix in the first place. And SDKs to implement them and or none of these are necessarily critical for correctness, but they may be critical for performance and performance is just harder to measure offhand. Um, so that state cache example is, like I said, closer to the microphone, sorry. Uh, like I said, it's, it's implemented, it's a feature that's implemented in the Beam portability layer, the Fun API, and requires coordination between the SDK and the runner halves of the worker. Not all runners implement it, and the runner has no requirement to use it all the time. So you can do all of those measurements and stuff, but ultimately, this is dissatisfying from an implantation point of view. Especially when you get to the point of if the only runner that actually implements these features is a paid service like Dataflow, you, have, you functionally need to be working on Dataflow to be able to use that cheaply, or, and it's not really, uh, it's, it's, it's less open for Beam to be able to, or for, for that to be the case, which is great for, you know, having a robust runner, but it's got details hidden within. So it's kind of doing the open source part of Beam a little bit of a disservice. This is not Dataflow's fault. This is just a consequence of uh, where implement the implementations are. So ultimately, all of this is to get to my first point, Oops, turning off the projector. Beam has a testing problem. <laughs> if we want to build new SDKs, we need to make it easier to test the portability surface. And it shouldn't be this hard to develop SDKs. Uh, the hardest part of an SDK should be, uh, or offering an SDK should be figuring out the right way to convey the user side of the Beam model in that particular language and make it easier for a uh, language uh, users to, uh, to, to write Beam pipelines. So now that you know the why, it's time to kind of get into the what. Um, I decided to write my own little runner about, uh, the, about in line with when I submitted this talk. Uh, and 
right now the goal of these the goal of my runner is that it's going to be a very test focused runner specifically on testing SDK side features and anything that's across the portability layer. At the absolute minimum, I wanted to replace the current Go Direct runner because it has received no love. Uh, it's going to be local, so it will only run on a single machine. And for speed, keep everything in memory. It turns out that Beam doesn't actually require a distributed system to operate. So this is a, overall a big feature of Beam. It makes things a lot of simpler, especially for the testing scenarios. Um, since there are different situations for each test, I feel that the runner should be more configurable on a per pipeline basis. So if, even if we're running multiple pipelines on it at the same time, each pipeline can operate its own configuration. Uh, so that in this case, you can test uh, multiple things in parallel rather than just waiting on each run independently. Of course, I don't want it to just be for the Go SDK, which is, uh, in case you couldn't tell, my whole jam. Uh, because if I can't have it for cross-language transforms, then I'm not even testing the whole Go SDK. So it needs to also be able to run Java and Python uh, transforms. And ultimately, of course, I need to contribute it to the repo so that uh, everyone can use it, and not just uh, Whoever, whoever sneaks a peek at my personal repo. Uh, one of the big blockers, of course, of contributing it to the repo is that names are very hard. Uh, I did a lot of brainstorming on different facets of what could be a good name for, for this runner, uh, and I haven't quite decided on one yet. So a little bit more work to do there. Uh, but I think uh, the, the ones at the bottom there, Prism and Lens, are real good beamy names. But I would feel bad about taking one of those names uh, just if it's, a, if it's a subpar runner. So maybe later. Uh, so what I've got so far uh, is currently up in my personal GitHub repo. Uh, since nav manually navigating a repo is not exactly enthralling talk content, I'm just going to give you some uh, highlights of currently how it's implemented. Uh, so. That link will, should stay up uh, there for all the subsequent slides. Feel free to navigate to it. It's all written in Go. Uh, so with the main details, uh, first, in order to kind of bootstrap the, uh, the, the runner development process, uh, Beam has this delightful feature called loopback mode. Uh, so it, it this simplifies uh, runner and SDK development dramatically. Uh, I think all the SDKs have a loopback execution environment at this point. Uh, in case you weren't aware, a loopback mode is when the pipeline construction process is also the same process that operates as a worker. Uh, it, everything ultimately ends up communicating over gRPC, uh, over the fun API, uh, but no containers end up being involved. Uh, this whole process is also what allows, uh, by, uh, this is a, a hmm. uh, this is another reason why I would like everything to be a portable runner, uh, especially uh, because it lets you actually talk to the different SDKs on an even basis, unlike uh, any of the direct runners. Uh, currently, uh, my runner as implemented, implement, uh, executes every transform one at a time. Uh, so there's no graph optimizations. So while this is much slower and you wouldn't want to use it for production because everything is getting materialized or encoded and materialized, because everything is getting encoded and materialized, it's actually testing the coders, which often gets ignored when you're running things in a direct runner. Uh, because uh, encoding is often the slowest part of any, part, any particular pipeline. Uh, group by keys currently, uh, like I said, are going to be handled in memory, uh, which because it's a simple sing uh, single local machine runner, this is kind of handled with a single uh, standard Go map. Just need to make sure that the keys are appropriately set up and most of the work is done for me. Um, and that's kind of it because the moment you have everything kind of on a single machine, you avoid a lot of the complexity that real runners or other runners uh, need to deal with, with the whole 
distributing things amongst multiple machines. And well, goodness, a distributed shuffle by itself. <laughs> That's a lot of work. So now that I've kind of proved that this exists, I can sort of talk about why uh, this sort of thing would be actually more useful, also useful for users and not just uh, SDK contributors. Uh, right now, uh, this is what currently works in uh, my runner because uh, I've only put eh, maybe a week into it <laughs> at this point. Uh, somewhere also in the repo, by the way, is a big, huge readme log of my development log of how I've been adding features to it. Uh, so you can really see how the sausage is made that way. Uh, but moving on to kind of what would be what users could find useful for this if this uh, once this is more complete is like, for example, you're authoring a new combined fund, for example. And like, no, Beam's got a handle on combined funds. All the runners will just do that evenly, right? So a combined fund by itself uh, is made up of kind of four different methods, one of which is required, three of which are optional. And which ones you implement of those optional types kind of determines how the rest of your types in your pipeline work. Create accumulators uh, initializes uh, an accumulator type. Add input uh, takes that input type and an accumulator and produces another accumulator. Merge accumulators is the one required operation doing what it says on the tin. And extract output turns your accumulators into your ultimate output types. So how, of, how does this often execute? Well, in the simplest case, with just merge accumulators, you don't have problems with testing. Your input type is the accumulator type, which is also the output type. Great. In both lifted and unlifted modes, you end up having a group by key added in there, uh, where all the keys are put in together, all your values are gathered together. And in the unlifted case, that's where merge accumulator runs. In, when optimized, the merge is lifted through the grouping, and this ultimately can reduce the amount of data that comes through the group by key operation, uh, making the pipeline more efficient. Uh, this overall optimization has many names depending on the context, but I believe Beam ultimately settles on combiner lifting. Okay, so the problems though start when testing this, uh, when you start to have the additional methods. So if you have an add input and an extract output, uh, you need those sometimes when you want to actually have a diff an entirely different accumulator type that will retain more information, but you don't need that information afterwards, or you need extra information in order to compute the actual thing. Uh, a good example of this is uh, if you're trying to get a, a, a proper uh, mean for anything in your uh, pipeline, you generally want to have uh, the count and the actual sum, but you don't need those things separated out afterwards. You can just have whatever float type you want to actually produce the mean when you're extracting the output. So very useful combined funds. Um, but when we take a look at the lifted approach, we get a zeroed accumulator for the key, and then we perform an add input on it for each things matching that key, and instead of using the merge directly. This is funneled through the group by key step, at which point all the accumulators from all the different bundles are merged together, and finally the output is extracted. But if you look, in the unlifted case, there's never any reason to call it merge accumulators, which means that in any kind of simple direct runner, you're not actually testing your merge method. And currently there's no good way of guaranteeing this short of manually calling it yourself, which I certainly advocate for. But it's, oh goodness, <laughs> five minutes left. Uh, so in, yeah, in runners that don't lift compiners, it's possible to never test your merge method even if you have a huge variety of pipeline-oriented tests. Um, runners are given a lot of leeway in when to use these features. Combiner lifting works best when you've got very large bundles. So depending on the execution mode, the runner might not decide to use it at all. In this case, combiner lifting is best when bundles are really big. 
and can have no benefit at all when bundles are really small. And these largely line up for batch and streaming operations. Um, a more elaborate example, which I, I'm glad that I, I didn't have too many slides for, is when you're writing a splittable do fund. Like combined funds, they also have a whole lot of different parts that, in order, that need to be executed in order to test and verify. But it's not necessarily going to uh, be able to uh, execute any particular mode of splitting. You might get initial splits. You'll have your trackers created. You'll have your restrictions. They'll be sized. But if you want to verify that your or your splittable do fund is actually operating correctly with dynamic splitting or in very weird cases of dynamic splitting, you're either needing to uh, decompose this manually and call these things manually yourself, which uh, is, again, ultimately dissatisfying. Don't we as a community deserve better testing for the internal complexity of Beam? Um, so just to kind of wrap things up, uh, I do have kind of secret goals for my runner to deal with in the long term. Uh, I kind of want this to end up being the best single machine runner. This keeps the complexity low and it doesn't involve needing to compete with Flink or Spark or, well, Dataflow. I want it to be modular so it's easier to add different custom scenarios for these things and additional options. Offhand, this uh, means allowing some production features for more robust execution, like uh, adding uh, graph optimizations and disk spillover in case you want to not keep everything in memory or be able to deal with larger data sets. Without either of these, this, the single transform in memory approach uh, prevents this kind of robust testing of your code. But I also want to be able to have better automation for, sing, or for testing SDK features. With cross language and a very cooperative runner there, you could imagine having a test suite that is pretending to have a cross language transform and using that to test SDK side features more easily. You just wrap a cross language transform in it and suddenly you have a source that is producing an expected test case. And you could similarly do the same thing to check a, an expected output. I don't know when I will get it there, but hopefully it won't be too long before uh, it gets to the point where this kind of thing is enabled. Um, so uh, thank you very much for listening. Uh, this has been Oops, I Wrote a Portable Runner in Go. Uh, thank you for watching. Oh, 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 oh